Good afternoon, everybody. Um, like my title slide says, I wanted to take probably about half of my time today and give everybody a little reminder. Some of the most successful and, if I may add, wealthiest people in the mining industry period have dedicated their lives to the pursuit of exploration for new discoveries. Uh, these guys could do pretty much anything they wanted at this point, but inevitably they go back into the exploration space. And given the run that the producers have had, given the run that Bullion has had, given the stability we're seeing with the ETF inflows, I thought I would take an opportunity as a representative of the junior explorers and show some examples of why we put up with things like this. Isolation from friends and family in the middle of nowhere, difficult working conditions in the snow and the cold and the wet in the middle of nowhere. This is probably quite different than your typical Geneva office other than that. And of course there's bugs. Anybody that's worked in the field has woken up to this and you have to work your way through this to get to the helicopter. And sometimes a combination of all three, cold and wet and bugs. <laughs> this would epitomize pretty much the worst day any geologist could have in the field where there's so many bugs and you're also wet and you're trying to keep yourself dry. There's also a matter of a complete lack of respect from the mining industry as a whole. A complete lack of recognition from the industry as a whole. This is the S&P TSX venture. We're actually on this, the TSX main board, but this is a good example of what the last three years has been like for this space. So despite all these hardships and the physical difficulty, why do we continue to explore? Why bother? Well, the answers are simple. The joy of exploration, number one, is the explosive valuation growth that everyone's experienced at discovery. And joy number two is the explosive valuation growth you get at acquisition. And very often, these two things follow in quick succession. Some examples I'm going to give that have direct relationships to the projects that we're working on or the people that are working on them are Virginia Gold's 2004 Eleanor Gold Discovery in Quebec, Meg Silver's Valdicani's discovery, discovery, excuse me, West Timmins, uh, Darren Wagner, our CEO's previous project, the 2008 Thunder Creek Discovery and subsequent sale to Lakeshore Gold, and one that a lot of you may not be aware of, except the Australians that are here, is the Sirius Resources 2012 Nova Bollinger Discovery. This is why we do it. This is Virginia Gold. This is a gold deposit very similar to our Eleanor Gold project, about 600 kilometers north. They discovered uh, in trench samples, not even in drill holes, 9 grams per ton over 7 meters, which is not particularly uh, interesting in today's world. The stock went from, I believe, about 85 cents to $15 over the course of 637 days. $10,000 invested in July 2004 by April 2006 would have yielded you $140,000. Everybody has their favorite example of what this is, but I felt it was worth reminding you guys of why you should pay attention when junior companies like ours come and talk to you, because if you're not involved in this type of thing, you're going to miss out on these gains. Mag Silver, a project that our lead director, uh, um, Dan McInnes, was involved in, as well as Darren and myself peripherally, uh, found, I would argue, probably the best silver discovery in, in Mexican history in the past 30 years, 1,800 grams of silver over six years. <coughs> If you invested $10,000 the day before they discovered it, you'd make $150,000 in July 2007 over, over, sorry, what does that say, 580 days. Now, in all fairness to Michael, who's going to be presenting after me, this, took, this is quite a deep intersection. It took quite a while to realize the absolute remarkable significance of this silver discovery. West Tim is mining, probably the most pertinent one to my company. This was a project that was um, scoped executed and the acquisition was executed by our current CEO, Darren Wagner, who couldn't be here today. And he probably wouldn't want to present this anyways because he likes to talk about himself. Uh, in 2008, Thunder Creek Gold Discovery, right across the border from the Lakeshore Gold Mine, was 11 grams per ton over 10 meters. 2009 acquisition by Lakeshore Gold for $424 million, which I forgot to add is 40% of that acquisition, which gives a deposit of value of $1 billion. $10,000 invested in November 2008, would have been worth $200,000 362 days later in November 2009, or about 350, 350 days, I should say. And interestingly, probably the most 
<coughs> uh, significant one, the 2012 Nova Bollinger Nickel Discovery, 4 meters, 3.8% nickel in Western Australia. Uh, the stock went from $0.06 cents here, straight to $2. They evaluated the project for, for nine months. They found a deeper extension of it. The stock went to $5. And that is a return of $800,000 or a $10,000 investment in less than 233 days. Now, this two points I want to make about this slide is, number one, the incredible value that the market gives to quality nickel sulfide assets anywhere in the world because they're scarce. The nickel market is at the bottom right now because of, there's a lot of laterites that are in production. But when you find a quality, high-grade nickel asset that makes money today, which this one does, the market pays enormously for it. Ultimately, this was sold for $1.8 billion US, and right there, it had a $9 million market cap. Good example of why you want to be involved in nickel, and also why you want to be involved in juniors. So we have a saying in our industry, don't bet on the horse, bet on the jockey. How do we get involved in one of these deals? When successful explorers are drilling, you should own their shares. But Ensure that your upside hasn't been diluted away. In the case of Nova Bollinger, Sirius Resources, in their rush to get it to production, they diluted themselves from 85 million shares to over 450 million shares. So when the $1.2 billion acquisition came, everybody made two bucks a share and nothing more. You have to be careful of that. And one of, the, one of the things that we're doing as a company on one of these softer periods is we're holding back on our exploration. We're not putting six or seven drills. We're not going through feasibility studies. We're waiting for the market and the <coughs> for that and we don't have to include the pollution required. You also have to make sure that they have a sound exploration thesis and they're exploring in a sound jurisdiction. As those are the basic rules that everybody in my office invests in. This is exactly the rules that we follow. So on that note, I mentioned it before, but Darren Wagner was involved in West Timmins. He was the, the architect of West Timmins. Dan McInnes was involved in Mag Silver. And Richard Mann is now two-time explorer of the year 2013-2014 in Quebec for the two discoveries that this company has made. And I found diamonds, but it was a long time ago. So what is our exploration thesis? This is the Abitibi sub-province in the Superior Province in Quebec and Ontario. Once we finished the West Timmins mining and sold that to Lakeshore Gold, we put together a thesis as a group that was quite simple. Throughout the Abitibi Greenstone Belt, there are deep-seated, large deformation zones slash shear zones slash structures. And along each of these structures is the second highest concentration of high-grade gold in the world after the Vizfotterstrand Basin in South Africa. Now, everything on the south half of here has been explored for the better part of 200 years and is, for the most part, exposed bedrock. As you move north, accessibility, especially historic accessibility, bed bedrock cover, and just the amount of exploration means there's fewer and fewer mines in that part of the world. So our exploration thesis was quite simple. Acquire as much of the Sunday Lake deformation zone along the strike from the Detour Lake gold mine, 15 million ounce gold mine, half a million ounces of production last year, and start exploring under that overburden cover and see what we can find. As far as infrastructure goes, a grisette nickel deposit is, whoop, sorry. A nickel deposit here is about 25 kilometers from uh, paved highway, about 55 kilometers from one, or more, one of our more likely acquirers, which would be Glencore, who owned the Metogamy Gold, the Metogamy EMS mine. Um, currently, end of life for that is, is uh, targeted in about 2018. But the real key to us is the Detour Lake Gold Mine. If you wanted to give our exploration thesis in one sentence, it would be, we're trying to find more detour gold mines along the same structure that hosts it. So how are we doing testing our thesis? In 2012, we found the high-grade Martinier gold system. In 2013, we followed that up with a second gold system uh, perpendicular to it, which is the Bug Lake Gold Deposit. And for that, we got the AEMQ dis discovery of the year. In 2014, by accident, when we were looking along a structural corridor, we found the Grisette Nickel Deposit. And that took up most of 2015, was evaluating the quality of that asset. Unfortunately, between discovering it and uh, fully evaluating it, we released a released resource about two weeks ago, uh, the nickel market collapsed. So we published a resource in the bottom of the nickel market. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. 2016, which a lot of our shareholders are quite happy about, we finished with our nickel asset. We fully understand it. We're now renewing our focus on gold and primarily on 
delivering to the market a good idea of what the Bug Lake Gold asset is. This is our Marnier Gold system. This sample runs 9,710 grams per ton gold. It is, by all definition, a classic Abitibi gold system. High grade, near surface, vein hosted gold in, in a number of parallel zones. It's about a two point, ah, the wrong button, sorry. It's about a 2.4 kilometer, 2, 2 kilometer by 4 kilometer system. It has two main uh, developed systems, the Bug Lake system and the Martin West system. But there's also about 20 other high grade gold discoveries that we've made. And remember, all the exploration we're doing in this area is under about 20 to 30 meters of glacial till. So our only two methods are geophysics and drilling. So to be able to go after essentially regional geophysical structures and be able to hit high grade gold over and over again is quite a testament. This is the Bug Lake Gold Zone. Uh, this is the principal focus of the work that we're going to be doing over the next 6 to 12 months. We've so far drilled the north half of it to the type of drill spacing you need to publish a measured and indicated resource. 25 to 50 meter drill spacing is down to about 250 meters. The southern half is now the focus. We have a drill sitting right there today, and it's going to progressively work its way down to the end, and all the way down to the Sunday Lake Deformation Zone. The shear zone that hosts the Detroit Lake Gold Mine and likely can place the gold in this system is, sits right in here, detours about 45 kilometers to the west. This was a big success of our summer program last year. We took a bunch of uh, seemingly random gold intersections, and with my more detailed drilling, we were able to define nine separate lenses of gold, nine separate uh, bodies, and we were able to tie them together sequentially across about 500, 500 to 600 meters of strike length. By the end of this year in 2016, we hope to have this type of resolution across the top 250 meters of the system for the full 1.6 to 1.8 kilometers of strike length, and then that will then be put into a resource that we'll put into the market. And as I note here, 91% gold recovery in metallurgy, not surprising, but nice to see. And 95% of our drilling is about the 250 meter vertical level. But the system does have immense depth potential. Gold deposits within this region occur along major structural faults, and they all run to 6, 7, 8, 1,000 meters depth. As a junior company, with the delusion we would have to face to drill that deep, we haven't done a lot of it. But the, the drilling we have done, Gives us some great numbers. 77 and a half grams over 1.4, 100 grams over half a meter, 11 grams. These are all in the three, 300 to 450 meter level. This will be the, the uh, carrot that we hope will attract a major partner to this project. They will see the depth potential, they'll see that there's gold down there, they'll see our early stage uh, um, structural analysis of it and see that, that whatever we release as a resource for the shallow 250 can only get better at depth. There's been a lot of talk about what's going to happen in the gold market here, rightly so. Uh, Martin Ayer's answer to the gold market is high grade, similar to the way Mag Silver's answer to the silver market is the highest grade that anybody's ever seen. Uh, we have consistently, every year, throughout the system, published extraordinarily high grades. The way we say it in the office is, this is the kind of grades that simply have to come out of the ground in any market. And it's worth pointing out that there's only 20 meters of overbird sitting over this, and we're 40 kilometers from the beach, we're 40 kilometers from Hecla at Casperardi, and 25 kilometers from Powerline. So we can move this forward quite quickly. Now, when Ian Telfer paid $420 million for the Eleanor Gold deposit back in 2006, he made a statement in his press release that I thought was very interesting because he had to buy it without a resource. That, that and Thunder Creek are probably the only two significant gold acquisitions made without a published resource. And what he said was, that it was worth buying at this, at this stage because over 70% of the holes that they've drilled have intersected greater than 10 grams per ton gold. Well, I naturally went to our, our technical team and said, what percentage of our holes have? And of the 129 holes we've so drilled in the system, 51% have returned assays greater than 10 grams per ton gold. Now, given that they have exposed bedrock in Eleanor, and we have 20 to 30 meters of, of overburden, which makes it a little more difficult to find your spot sometimes, I think we're doing pretty well. And by the way, we have an extremely high grade massive sulfide nickel deposit. Uh, this is a Grisset H3. This sample ran 14.6% nickel, 1.1% copper, and almost 13 grams PGE's plus gold. 
And importantly, it had 19% nickel tenor, which is the maximum nickel price, nickel value of any particular sample, and 95% of the sulfides are in complement. It's almost the most perfect nickel ore you could ask for. It runs about 550 meters in strike length, goes down to about 550 meters in depth. And one of the last holes of our 2015 season that intersected 10.5% nickel over 7.5 meters at the 400 meter level. We have not really drilled below that hole at all. That's going to be coming probably once the nickel market improves. I doubt we'll go after any quarter million, half a million dollar holes down to 500 meters until the nickel market improves dramatically. Just a laundry list of uh, what percent looks like. It's got a positive simple metallurgy. We get a 13.5% nickel con with an 86.5% recovery, which is top quartile for the, for the nickel. Uh, it's got well developed infrastructure, which I went over, and we own it 100% with no royalties. So, this is what a resource looks like on an 18 million ton deposit when you release it during $4 nickel. Uh, it's 3.5 million tons using a 1% cutoff at 1.8%. Now, what we're seeing in the nickel market is telling us that nickel prices are going to improve dramatically. There, it's, a, it's a collision between mine closures, production cuts, and simply the, the inventory is dropping. Right now, without question, there's a half a million tons sitting on the LME. There's a further three to 400,000 tons sitting on off-exchange stocks. But Indonesia has not softened their stand on exporting law or so I believe that those stocks will be completed in the next 9 to 18 months. When that happens, and you start to see nickel prices back at sustainable levels of $750, $859, this deposit turns into this deposit. This is a 14-year mine life of 2,000 tons per day underground nickel mine. This is our resource published. Uh, you can see 3.5 million tons of 1.8%. And if you go to a 0.5% cutoff, which is probably more realistic in a, in a uh, typical nickel market, you're looking at 10 million tons at just over 1%. It is a, I put this up only to show you that is, the, the days of simply drawing a box around your resource and publishing a number are over. The, this is a well-stressed resource. We had to apply metallurgical recoveries to this resource. We had to apply very conservative nickel prices, very conservative metal prices. We had to apply a 30% haircut for smelter, which I don't, I've never seen a resource that had to do that. Milling, mining, recovery, M&A, actually uh, GNA costs, all have to be applied to this resource before we can publish it. This is the new reality of 4311 CIM. The best way to look at it, we have three and a half million tons of bulletproof nickel resource that works today, and it can only get better. We also own the entire district. As soon as, as soon as we discovered Grisette, we immediately went to stake everything within the intrusive complex to host it. And we've been actively exploring, uh, in, mostly in the area immediately surrounding it. And you can see the, the blue stars. Every single one of those is a nickel sulfide occurrence near surface that has just as good signature as the initial discovery hole at Grisette. But because of the way the nickel market has been going, it hasn't really been encouraging to us to go after and try to vector in on these and see where they are. It's also worth mentioning that that sample there is a 200 gram per ton gold sample, and these samples over here are in the teens, 12 and 15 gram per ton gold. So just like with our larger exploration thesis, there's a lot of gold in this system. So upcoming value drivers. As I said, continued delineation of bug lake zones, aiming for an initial shallow 4001 resource. I'm going to say out loud towards the end of the year, but we've added another 600 meters to it. It's going to take a lot of drilling at 25 meter space to define that, so stay tuned for that. Uh, continued expansion. We believe that the Bug Lake system goes all the way to the Sunday Lake Deformation Zone. We believe it goes north past Black Lake Rock, so we're, going to, we're drilling for that one right now. And those 15 gold targets, 15 initial gold hits or gold targets that we have in the Martinier system, we're also going off to those. And there's 20 additional shallow early stage gold discoveries in Martinier West, Lac de Doie, and we always set aside about 25% of our budget to go after regional exploration targets on the rest of the property. On the nickel side, we're continuing to expand the percent of the PG deposit, but I doubt you will see it in, this, in the winter of the spring program. We'll likely go after that uh, in the upcoming, the upcoming fall program, which coincides with where we believe the nickel market is going. Now you remember I said make sure your upside has not been diluted out. We've done a great deal of work over five years in this project and thankful, thankfully to the uh, charity flow through and the flow through functionality that we have in Quebec, we have almost no warrants outstanding. I did the math on this. If we had raised money without the flow through mechanism, we would have 190 million shares outstanding right now. 
But as it stands right now, if a four or $500 million offer comes for either of our assets, your upside potential is three, four, five dollars per transaction. So it's critically important to us as large shareholders of the company ourselves to keep that upside intact. We got 9.3 million in cash. That's not as per our last financial. That's as of when I left the office on Friday. And uh, it gives us a market cap of $60 million. We did trade up to $1.98 on the back of the Grisset discovery followed by the 9,000 gram per ton gold discovery. Um, so we've got a lot of upside left to go. So thank you very much. I hope I was able to uh, reinvigorate your desire to be involved in these small exploration companies and be part of some big discoveries that are coming up. Thank you very much.